you will hear a conversation between a psychiatrist in the medical centre of the college and a new student. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to four. Hello, sit down, please. Thank you. Now you are a new patient, aren't you?、Y、yes, that's right. Okay, so I'd better get some basic details down first. Right, we'll start with your name. Martin Hansen. Do you spell that S O N or S E N? H A N S E N. Okay, and you're a first year student. Yes, I am. Study in、uh, electronics, actually. Ah, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. And your address? Two eight o five Hesperian Avenue, Hayward. Two eight o five and Hesperian. Yes, that's H E S P E R I A N, Hayward, H A Y W A R D. And your phone number? Seven three four two four six five five. Seven three four two six four five five. No, you got the six and the four the wrong way round. It's two four six five five. Huh? Sorry. Right. And、um, when were you born? Ah,、uh, the fifteenth of June, nineteen eighty-six. Here in New Zealand? No, I was born in Sydney. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions five to ten. Good. So, what's your problem? Well. Frankly, I wonder whether it is a problem. I get the blues, and it lasts for quite a while. I don't know how to. Yes, we all feel sad or get the blues now and again. Generally, our sadness lessens in time, and with the support of friends. However, if the depression leads to difficulty in thinking and greatly disrupts your daily routine, it can be evidence of a psychiatric problem. What do you feel exactly? I always feel sad and worthless. I find it hard to fall asleep and wake up early in the morning. How long has it lasted? Nearly half a month. Do you feel fatigue or loss of energy, or you may have lost interest or pleasure in usual activities? Yes, sometimes. At first, I thought I could overcome it by myself, but I failed. And、I'm so glad that you came here. It seems that you are suffering mild depression from your symptoms. Depression? Yes, I feel depressed sometimes. But why would I? Depression may occur as a result of biochemical changes in the body. Alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine, and LSD can bring on depression. Those who have a family history of depression usually have a greater risk of depression. Sometimes the worrying changes in life can lead to depression. I see. I had a really bad breakup of a love relationship. It makes me feel hopeless. Do you think I need some treatment? Yes. Antidepressant medications are often used to treat depression if it is serious. But I don't suggest them at first because of the side effects. I suggest psychotherapy, which can give you support and help you regain control. So, do I need to come here every day? No, I will arrange counselling sessions for you, which will last twelve to twenty weeks. You come here once or twice each week. The psychotherapy is directed at helping you gain insight and understanding about events in your life, which may have contributed to your depression. With growing insight, you can often learn more effective ways of coping with your feelings and changing your behaviour. What can I do to take care of myself? Well, at first you should do some physical exercises on a regular basis, at least three times a week. How is your food? Do you eat well?、Mm, yes, I think so. I eat at my homestay family. Good. 
Find a hobby or a positive recreational activity to participate in once or twice a week. I know it's difficult for you, though. When you feel it's hard to overcome the depression, come to the counseling session. Remember, ask for help if the load is too heavy to handle. Yes, I'll try. So, when will my counseling session begin? I'm going to arrange that for you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a recorded message giving information about an area where tourists can visit to taste local food. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully to the first part of the message and answer questions 11 to 13. Welcome to the tourist information line for the Valley Food Trail. Here you will find many local food products for you to sample and buy. It is possible for you to spend as much or as little time as you want, but I suggest that you allow a full day for touring this area. Of course, there are many half-day tours available for those of you short on time. Now, it's quite a large area and stretches from Brookville to Ford Hill. For those of you unfamiliar with the area, that means that it is 10 kilometres to 35 kilometres from the city centre, or by car 15 minutes to the closest point, continuing to 55 minutes at its furthest point from the CBD. Of course, apart from food, there are many other places of interest in this area, including cafes and restaurants and galleries and studios. But I wouldn't recommend you go here to see parks and gardens. The other information lines will give you specific information related to these particular attractions. Before the final part of the message, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 14 to 20. Now answer questions 14 to 20. But let's go back to food. If we begin in Brookville and head north towards Upper Valley in a clockwise direction, passing West Valley on West Road, we cross over Coast Road to come to our first place of interest, Magic Coffee. This is not to be confused with the coffee house, situated opposite on the other side of the valley on the railway line. Magic Coffee is next to the chocolate company, which is on the corner. Just past the ice cream shop on the corner of John Street is the fresh produce shop. A little further north, we have reached Ford Hill, where we can start our drive southwards along Great Northern Highway following the railway line. First, we come to the organic market near the corner of Memorial Avenue and then to Olive Farm opposite Olive Road. Just before we come to the next street crossing, we see the Honey Pot, which is practically opposite the coffee house. There is another chocolate company which sells nougat as well, just nearby. Following the railway line along Great Northern Highway, we return back to Brookville. 
Now, as I have said previously, if you only have a few hours to spare, there are several places that you shouldn't miss. The two chocolate places make equally nice chocolate, but the factory has the added bonus of nougat, unlike the company. Of course, everyone loves ice cream, especially unusual flavours such as coffee and nougat. So the ice creamery is definitely worth a visit. And while the coffee house sells expertly made hot drinks, including hot chocolate, I think your time would be better spent sampling the many products on offer at the organic market. Well, I hope you enjoy your time visiting the Valley Food Trail and enjoy all the wonderful local foods on offer. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two engineering students, a woman in her sixth year called Linda, and a man in his fifth year called Matthew, discussing the benefits of student work placements. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Hi, Linda. Can you spare a few minutes? Hello, Matthew. No problem. I just wanted to talk to you about temporary work placements. I've never really thought there was a good reason for doing one. I've got some savings, so I don't really need the money at the moment. But I've had an email from the university about a vacancy that looks quite interesting. You did a placement last year, didn't you? I did, yes. In my case, I wanted to find out if I was making the right career choice before I began applying for permanent jobs. I thought I wanted to work in car manufacturing, but I wasn't sure, so I applied to Toyota. What was the application process like? Lengthy. There were a lot of different parts to it. The dullest one was a psychometric test. You know, when you have to answer loads of questions about yourself, and you're trying to guess what's the best thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then there was an activity that we did in groups, which I found really fascinating. Engineers are renowned for being a bit unsociable, but I thought we made a great team, and we had an individual task too. We had to sort through various business documents and prioritize them. It was just like what you have to do as a student, really, just with different content. What exactly were you doing on the placement? I was helping to design some diagnostic software to identify any waste in the car assembly process. Do you mean waste of materials? No, time. Anything that can speed the process up helps to cut costs. How did the work placement compare to being a student? Was it hard work? Yes, it was. I'd had full-time work before. I've done various unskilled jobs during university holidays, and some of those involve long hours. So I thought I'd find it easy. I was wrong, though. I think when you're on placement, you're always trying to prove yourself. So you push yourself hard to succeed. Yes, but I got a lot of support from my employers. They were always helpful. And then at the end of the placement, I was given formal feedback. Do you mean on your engineering ability? Well, no. I didn't really need that because we had team meetings every other day, and so I had the chance to discuss technical issues and ask about anything that wasn't clear. The evaluation was about general workplace things like organizational ability, initiative, 
that sort of thing. I get the impression you think you benefited from the placement. Well, the best thing is that they've offered me a job for next year. Depending on my exam results, of course, but still. A permanent one? Yes. But apart from that, I learned so much. The industrial environment was much more demanding than the academic one. So my general skills improved. Like time management, meeting deadlines. And on the technical side, I learned new software packages, like MS Project. Well, I think you've convinced me that work placements are worthwhile, but while you're here, can you give me advice on something else? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm about to make a start on the engineering materials module and I've got a book list here. Can you have a quick look and tell me what you would recommend? That's if you can remember. Let's see. I do remember some of them. Hmm. Yes, this one. The Science of Materials. I found the subject quite hard generally, but this book is very accessible, so it suited me. It doesn't cover everything, though. What about this one, then? Materials Engineering? Oh, yes. I do remember that. But it's a bit out of date now, isn't it? Unless it's a new edition. I don't think so. But what I liked about it were the pictures. They really help to understand the descriptions. It's useful just from that point of view. Let's see. What else? Oh, yes. That one there. Engineering Basics. I think out of all these, that's got the widest coverage. But I've looked at the contents page and it hardly mentions nanotechnology. Yes, you're right. The evolution of materials does, though. It's a recent publication, so it covers all the latest developments. It's a bit thin on the 1960s, though, and that decade was quite important. Well, it sounds as if they all complement each other in some ways. I don't suppose you can lend me... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Oh. You will hear part of a lecture on the current and future use of mobile phones. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 35. Okay, now today we're looking at changes in communication, and specifically changes that have just happened or are likely to happen in the next few years. Key to this is the mobile phone, which is increasingly being seen as an all-purpose system rather than just a phone. If you only use your phone for texting and making calls now, you will be amazed at how you'll be using it in the future. The technology has been developed for a range of other uses. For example, phones could be used so that if you are meeting someone and they get lost, you could send them a map of your location to help them. This will save all those complicated explanations over the phone and our poor friends or colleagues trying to drive and find out where they are at the same time. 
And if you get bored waiting, or if you're traveling, for example, you will soon be able to see TV news on your phone as it is actually being broadcast. This means that you won't have to miss any of your favorites if you were away for a few days. Most people have got used to texting now, and young people send pictures to each other. But what is exciting is the possibility of putting music with them before you send them. And it's not all frivolous. Phones are going to become even more critical in business and education. Some recent developments have a highly practical usage. So, for example, as lecturers, we will be able to send everybody a text to let them know if lectures have been cancelled. And the new phones could have a further use in education, as well as business, as they will enable us to go to any destination, such as when we are doing a field trip, for instance. And from there, to send data directly to a computer so that we can access it when we get home. This means we will no longer be limited by what the phone can store. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 36 to 40. And it's interesting to look at the different ways that men and women use phones now as that does affect how the technology will develop. Some research has been done on how people use phones and some of the results are surprising. One of the increasing usages of mobile phones is to get all sorts of data such as phone numbers, the weather, train times, etc. And while there's been an attempt to set up connections with things that women might be interested in accessing, it is overwhelmingly men who do this. But what about the traditional use of a phone? To speak to people? I suppose we would predict that it is mainly women who use phones as a method of contact for friends and family, but, in fact, the genders exploit this facility equally. I've spoken about the increased business usages that phones will offer, and I suppose we would associate this usage with men. The survey picked up, though, that women are often working from home or catching up with work in the evenings, so they use phones in this way as much as men do. Most of us are aware we can store photos on our phones. It's an ideal method of capturing a moment wherever you are. Women tend to be the group that keep photos on their phones, but it seems that men use their phones to actually take pictures much more than women do. And, of course, all this knowledge affects the marketing that the companies will do in order to sell That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answer. Hey.